Chapter Eleven of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Callista's preaching and what came of it. It is undeniably a solemn moment under any circumstances, and requires a strong heart when any one deliberately surrenders himself, soul and body, to the keeping of another while life shall last. And this, or something like this, reserving the supreme claim of duty to the Creator is the matrimonial contract in individual cases it may be made without thought or distress but surveyed objectively and as carried out into a sufficient range of instances it is so tremendous an undertaking that nature seems to sink under its responsibilities when the christian binds himself by vows to a religious life he makes a surrender to him who is all-perfect and whom he may unreservedly trust moreover looking at that surrender on its human side he has the safeguard of distinct provisos and regulations and of the principles of theology to secure him against tyranny on the part of his superiors but what shall be his encouragement to make himself over without condition or stipulation as an absolute property to a fallible being and that not for a season but for life the mind shrinks from such a sacrifice and demands that as religion enjoins it religion should sanction and bless it it instinctively desires that either the bond should be dissoluble or that the subjects of it should be sacramentally strengthened to maintain it so help me god the formula of every oath is emphatically necessary here but agellius is contemplating a superhuman engagement without superhuman assistance and that in a state of society in which public opinion which in some sense compensates for the absence of religion supplied human motives not for but against keeping it and with one who had given no indication that she understood what marriage meant no wonder then that in spite of his simplicity his sanguine temperament and his delusion the more he thought of the step he had taken the more unsatisfactory he found it and the nearer he grew to the time when he must open the subject with aristo the less he felt able to do so in consequence he was in a distress of mind as he ascended the staircase which led to his friend's lodging to which his anxiety as he mounted the hill on the other side of the city was tranquillity itself and except that he was coming by engagement he would have turned back and for the time at least have put the whole subject from his thoughts yet even then as often as callista rose in his mind's eye his scruples and misgivings vanished before the beauty of that image as mists before the sun and when he actually stood in her sweet presence it seemed as if some secret emanation from her flowed in upon his heart and he stood breathless and giddy under the intensity of the fascination however the reader must not suppose that in the third century of our era such negotiations as that which now seems to be on the point of coming off between callista and agellius were embellished with those transcendental sentiments and that magnificent ceremonial with which chivalry has invested them in these latter ages there was little occasion then for fine speaking or exquisite deportment and if there had been we who are the narrators of these hitherto unrecorded transactions should have been utterly unable to do justice to them at that time of day the christian had too much simplicity the heathen too little of real delicacy to indulge in the sublimities of modern love-making at least as it is found in novels and in the case before us both gentleman and lady will be thought we consider sadly matter-of-fact or rather semi-barbarous by the votaries of what is just now called european civilization on agellius's entering the room aristo was pacing to and fro in some discomposure however he ran up to his friend embraced him and looking at him with significance congratulated him on his good looks there is more fire in your eye he said dear agellius and more eloquence in the turn of your lip than i have ever yet seen a new spirit is in you so you are determined to come out of your solitude 
that you should have been able to exist in it so long is the wonderment to me agellius had recovered himself yet he dared not look again on callista do not jest aristo he said i am come as you know to talk to you about your sister i have brought her a present of flowers they are my best presents or rather not mine but the birth of the opening year as fair and fragrant as herself we will offer them to our palace athena said his friend to whom we artists are especially devout and he would have led agellius on and made him place them in her niche in the opposite wall i am more serious than you are said agellius and i have brought the best my garden contains as an offering to your sister she will not think i bring them for any other purpose where are you going he continued as he saw his friend take down his broad potassus oh why answered aristo since i am so poor an interpreter of your meaning you can dispense with me altogether i will leave you to speak for yourself and meanwhile we'll go and see what old romo has to tell before the sun is too high in the heavens saying this with a half imploring half satirical look at his sister he set off to the barbers at the forum agellius took up the flowers and laid them on the table before her as she sat at work do you accept my flowers callista he asked fair and fragrant like myself are they she made reply give them to me she took them and bent over them the blushing rose she said gravely the stately lily the royal carnation the golden moly the purple amaranth the green bryon the diosanthos the sertula the sweet modest saliunca fit emblems of callista <laughs> well in a few hours they will have faded yes they will get more and more like her she paused and looked him steadily in the face and then continued agellius i once had a slave who belonged to your religion she had been born in a christian family and came into my possession on her master's death she was unlike any one i have seen before or since she cared for nothing yet was not morose or peevish or hard-hearted she died young in my service shortly before her end she had a dream she saw a company of bright shades clothed in white like the hours which circle round the god of day they were crowned with flowers and they said to each other she ought to have a token too so they took her hand and led her to a most beautiful lady as stately as juno and as sweet as ariadne so radiant in countenance that they themselves suddenly looked like ethiopians by the side of her she too was crowned with flowers and these so dazzling that they might be the stars of heaven or the gems of asia for what chione could tell and that fair goddess angel you call her said my dear here is something for you from my son he sends you by me a red rose for your love a white lily for your chastity purple violets to strew your grave and green palms to flourish over it is this the reason why you give me flowers agellius that i may rank with chione and is this their interpretation callista he answered it is my heart's most fervent wish it is my mind's vivid anticipation that the day may come when you will receive such a crown nay a brighter one and you are come of course to philosophize to me and to put me in the way of dying like chione she made answer i implore your pardon you are offering me flowers seems not for a bridal wreath but for a funeral urn is it wonderful said agellius that the two wishes should have gone together in my heart and that while i trusted and prayed that you might have the same master in heaven as i have myself i also hoped you would have the same service the same aims the same home upon earth and that you should speak one word for your master and two for yourself she retorted 
"It has been by feeling how much you could be to me," he answered, "that I have been led to think how much my Master may be doing for you already, and how much, in time to come, you might do for Him. Callista, do not urge me with your Greek subtlety, or expect me to analyze my feelings more precisely than I have the ability to do may i calmly tell you the state of my mind as i do know it and will you patiently listen she signified her willingness and he continued this only i know he said what i have experienced ever since i first heard you converse that there is between you and me a unity of thought so strange that i should have deemed it could not have been before i found it actually to exist between any two persons whatever and which widely as we are separated in opinion and habit and differently as we have been brought up is to me inexplicable i find it difficult to explain what i mean we disagree certainly on the most important subjects yet there is an unaccountable correspondence in the views we take of things in our impressions in the line in which our minds move and the issues to which they come in our judgment of what is great and little and the manner in which objects affect our feelings when i speak to my uncle when i speak to your brother i do not understand them nor they me we are moving in different spheres and i am solitary however much they talk but to my astonishment i find between you and me one language is it wonderful that in proportion to my astonishment I am led to refer it to one cause, and think that one master hand must have engraven those lines on the soul of each of us. Is it wonderful that I should fancy that he who has made us alike has made us for each other, and that the very same persuasives by which I bring you to cast your eyes on me may draw you also to cast yourself in adoration at the feet of my master? for an instant tears seemed about to start from callista's eyes but she repressed the emotion if it were such and answered with impetuosity your master who is your master what know i of your master what have you ever told me of your master i suppose it is an esoteric doctrine which i am not worthy to know but so it is here you have been again and again and talked freely of many things yet i am in as much darkness about your master as if i had never seen you i know he died i know too that christians say he lives in some fortunate island i suppose for when i have asked you have got rid of the subject as best you could you have talked about your law and your various duties and what you consider right and what is forbidden and of some of the old writers of your sect and of the jews before them but if as you imply my wants and aspirations are the same as yours what have you done towards satisfying them what have you done for that master towards whom you now propose to lead me no she continued starting up you have watched those wants and aspirations for yourself not for him you have taken interest in them you have cherished them as if you were the author you the object of them you profess to believe in one true god and to reject every other and now you are implying that the hand the shadow of that god is on my mind and heart who is this god where how in what oh gellius you have stood in the way of him ready to speak for yourself using him as a means to an end oh callista said agellius in an agitated voice when he could speak do my ears hear aright do you really wish to be taught who the true god is no mistake me not she cried passionately i have no such wish i could not be of your religion ye gods how have i been deceived i thought every christian was like chione i thought there could not be a cold christian chione spoke as if a christian's first thoughts were good will to others 
as if his state were of such blessedness that his dearest heart's wish was to bring others into it here is a man who so far from feeling himself blessed thinks i can bless him comes to me me callista a, a herb of the field a poor weed exposed to every wind of heaven and shrivelling before the fierce sun to me he comes to repose his heart upon but as for any blessedness he has to show me why since he does not feel any himself no wonder he has none to give away i thought a christian was superior to time and place but all is hollow alas alas i am young in life to feel the force of that saying with which sages go out of it vanity and hollowness agellius when i first heard you were a christian how my heart beat i thought of her who was gone and at first i thought i saw her in you as if there had been some magical sympathy between you and her and i hoped that from you i might have learned more of that strange strength which my nature needs and which she told me she possessed your words your manner your looks were altogether different from others who came near me but so it was you came and you went and came again i thought it reserve i thought it timidity i thought it the caution of a persecuted sect but oh my disappointment when first i saw in you indications that you were thinking of me only as others think and felt towards me as others may feel that you were aiming at me not at your god that you had much to tell of yourself but nothing of him time was i might have been led to worship you agellius you have hindered it by worshipping me it is not often we suppose that such deep offence is given to a lady by the sort of admiration of which agellius had been guilty in the case of callista however startled as he might be and startled and stung he was there was too much earnestness in her distress too much of truth in her representations too much which came home to his heart and conscience to allow of his being fronted or irritated she had but supplied the true interpretation of the misgiving which had haunted him that morning from the time he set out till the moment of his entering the room jucundus some days back had readily acquiesced in his assurance that he was not inconsistent but callista had not been so indulgent though really more merciful there was a pause in the conversation or rather in her outpouring each had bitter thoughts and silently devoured them at length she began again so the religion of chione is a dream now for four years i had hoped it was a reality all things again are vanity i had hoped there was something somewhere more than i could see but there is nothing here am i a living breathing woman with an overflowing heart with keen affections with a yearning after some object which may possess me i cannot exist without something to rest upon i cannot fall back upon that drear forlorn state which philosophers call wisdom and moralists call virtue i cannot enroll myself a votary of that cold moon whose arrows do but freeze me i cannot sympathize in that majestic band of sisters whom rome has placed under the tutelage of vesta i must have something to love love is my life why do you come to me agellius with your every-day gallantry can you compete with the noble grecian forms which have passed before my eyes is your voice more manly are its tones more eloquent than those which have thrilled through my ears since i ceased to be a child can you add perfume to the feast by your wit 
or pour sunshine over a grot and rushing stream by your smile what can you give me there was one thing which i thought you could have given me better than anything else but it is a shadow you have nothing to give you have thrown me back upon my dreary dismal self and the deep wounds of my memory poor poor agellius but it was not his fault it could not be helped she continued as if in thought it could not be helped for if he had nothing to give how could he give it after all he wanted something to love just as i did and he could find nothing better than me and they thought to persuade her to spend herself upon him as she had spent herself upon others yes it was jucundus and aristo my brother even my own brother they thought not of me here her tears gushed out violently and she abandoned herself to a burst of emotion they were thinking of him i had hoped he could lead me to what was higher but woe woe she cried wringing her hands they thought i was only fit to bring him low well after all is callista really good for much more than the work they have sent her to do she was absorbed in her own misery in an intense sense of degradation in a keen consciousness of the bondage of nature in a despair of ever finding what alone could give meaning to her existence and an object to her intellect and affections and agellius on the other hand what surprise remorse and humiliation came upon him it was a strange contrast the complaint of nature unregenerate on the one hand the self-reproach of nature regenerate and lapsing on the other at last he spoke and they were his last words callista he said whatever injury i may have unwillingly inflicted upon you you at least have returned to me good for evil and have made yourself my benefactress certainly i now know myself better than i did and he who has made use of you as his instrument of mercy towards me will not forget to reward you tenfold one word will i say for myself nay not for myself but for my master do not for an instant suppose that what you thought of the christian religion is not true it reveals a present god who satisfies every affection of the heart yet keeps it pure i serve a master he continued blushing from modesty and earnestness as he spoke i serve a master whose love is stronger than created love god help my inconsistency but i never meant to love you as i love him you are destined for his love i commit you to him your true lord whom i never ought to have rivalled for whom i ought simply to have pleaded though i am not worthy to approach you i shall trace you at a distance who knows where perhaps even to the prison and to the arena of those who confess the saviour of men and dare to suffer and die for his name and now farewell to his keeping and that of his holy martyrs i commit you he did not trust himself to look at her as he turned to the door and left the room End of chapter 11chapter 12 of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain a death the first stages of repentance are but a fever in which there is restlessness and thirst hot and cold fits vague dreary dreams long darkness which seems destined never to have a morning effort without result and collapse without reaction these symptoms had already manifested themselves in agellius he spoke calmly to callista and sustained himself by the claims of the moment but no sooner had he left the room and was thrown upon himself than his self-possession left him and he fell into an agony or rather anarchy of tumultuous feelings then rose up before his mind a hundred evil spectres not less scaring and more real than the dreams of the delirious he thought of the singular favour which had been shown him in his reception into the christian fold and that at so early a date 
of the myriads all around who continued in heathenism as they had been born and of his utter insensibility to his own privilege he felt how much would be required of him and how little hitherto had been forthcoming he thought of the parable of the barren fig tree and the question was whispered in his ear whether it would not be fulfilled in him he asked himself in what his heart and his conduct differed from the condition of a fairly virtuous heathen and then he thought of callista in contrast with himself as having done more with the might which she possessed than he had done with many pounds he felt that tyre and sidon were rising up against him in her person or rather how the saying seemed about to be verified in her that strangers should sit down in the kingdom from far countries while those who were the heirs should be thrust out he had been rebuked by one to whom he rather ought to have brought self-knowledge and compunction and she was sensitively alive to his want of charity she had felt bitterly that she was left in ignorance and sin by one who had what she had not she had accused him of being zealous enough to win her to himself when he had shown no zeal at all to win her to her maker if she was brought to the truth at length there would be no thanks to him for the happy change yet on the other hand though he had predicted it alas was it likely that it would be granted had she not had her opportunity which was lost because he had not improved it yes she had with a deliberate mind and in set words put aside and taken leave of that which she once desired and hoped might have been her own sorrowfully indeed but peremptorily as firmly persisting in rejecting it as she might have persisted in maintaining it and if she died in infidelity horrible thought would not the burden lie on him and was this to be the token of the love which he pretended to entertain for her what was he living for what was the work he had set himself to do did he live to plant flowers or to rear fruit to maintain himself and to make money was that a time to pride himself on vineyards and olive-yards when like eliseus he was one among myriads who were in unbelief ah the difference between a saint and him of what good was he on earth why should not he die why so cherry of his life why preserve his wretched life at all could he not do more by giving it than by keeping it might it not have been given him if perchance for the very purpose that he might sacrifice it for him who had given it he had been timid about making a profession of his faith which might have led to prison and death but perhaps the very object of his life and the divine purpose the very reason of his birth had been that as soon as he was grown he should die for the truth he might have been cut off by disease he was not and why except that he might merit in his death and that what in the ordinary course of things was a mere suffering might in his case be an act of service his death might have been the conversion of thousands of callista and the fewness of his days here would have been his claim to a blessed eternity hereafter nor callista alone he had natural friends with nearer claims upon his charity had he been other than he was he might have prevailed with his uncle at least he might have taught him to respect the christian faith and name and restrained him from daring to attempt for he now saw that it was an attempt to seduce him into sin he might have lodged a good seed in his heart which in the hour of sickness might have germinated and his brother again had learned to despise him indeed he had raised in every one who came near him the suspicion that he was not really a christian that he was an apostate he could not help uttering a cry of anguish as he used the word an apostate from that which was his real life and supreme worship why did he not at once go into the basilica or the gymnasium and proclaim himself a christian there were rumours abroad that the new emperor was beginning a new policy towards his religion let him inaugurate it in agellius might he not thus perchance wash out his sin he would be led into the amphitheatre as his betters had been led before him the crowds would yell and the lion would be let loose upon him he would confront the edict tear it down be seized by the apparitor and hurried to the rack or the slow fire 
Callista would hear of it, and would learn at length he was not quite the craven and the recreant which she thought him. Then his thoughts took a turn. Callista? What was Callista to him? Why should he think of her when she was girding him to martyrdom? Was she to be the motive which was to animate him, and her praise his reward? Alas, alas, could he gain heaven by pleasing a heathen? But to whom, then, he continued, am I to look up? Who is to give me sympathy? Who is to encourage, to advise me? Oh, my father, pity me, a feeble child, a poor outcast, wandering sheep, away from the fold, torn by the briars and thorns, and no one to bind his wounds and retrace his steps for him. Why am I thus alone in the world? Why am I without a pastor and guide? Ah, was not this my fault in remaining in Sicca? I have no tie here. Let me go to Carthage, or to Tagasta, or to Madura, or to Hippo. I am not fit to walk the world by myself. I am too simple, and am no match for its artifices. Here another thought took possession of him, which had as yet but crossed his mind, and it made him colour up with confusion and terror. They were laying a plot for me, he said, my uncle and Aristo, and it is Callista who has defeated it. And as he spoke, he felt how much he owed to her, and how dangerous too it was to think of his death. Yet it would not be wrong to pray for her. She had marred the device of which she was to have been the agent. La queus contritus est, et nos liberati sumus. The net was broken, and he was delivered. She had refused his devotion, that he might give it to his God. And now he would only think of her, and whisper her name, when he was kneeling before the Blessed Mary, his advocate. Oh, that that second and better Eve, who brought salvation into the world, as our first mother brought death, oh, that she might bear Callista's name in remembrance, and get it written in the book of life. It was high noon, and all this time Agellius was walking in his present excited mood without covering to his head, under the burning rays of the sun, not knowing which way he went, and retracing his steps as he wandered about at random, with a vague notion he was going homewards. The few persons whom he met, creeping about under the shadow of the lofty houses or under the porticoes of the temples, looked at him with wonder, and thought him furious or deranged, the shafts of the sun were not so hot as his own thoughts or as the blood which shot to and fro so fiercely in his veins but they were working fearfully on his physical frame though they could not increase the fever of his mind he had come to the forum the market people were crouching under their booths or the shelter of their baskets the riffraff of the city who lived by their wits or by odd jobs or on the windfalls of the market lazy fellows who did nothing who did not move till hunger urged them like the boot half idiotic chewers of opium ragged or rather naked children the butcher boys and scavengers of the temples lay at their length at the mouth of the caverns formed by the precipitous rock or under the arch of triumph or amid the columns of the gymnasium and the heracleum or in the doorways of the shops a scattering of beggars were lying, poor creatures, on their backs in the blazing sun, reckless of the awful maladies, the fits, the seizures, and the sudden death, which might be the consequence. Numbers out of this mixed multitude were asleep. Some were looking with dull, listless eyes at the still scene, or at any accidental movements which might vary it. They saw a figure coming nearer and nearer, and wildly passing by just then agellius was diverted from his painful meditations by hearing one of these fellows say to another as he roused from a sort of doze that's one of them we know them all but very poor pickings can be got out of them but he has more than most they're a low set in sicca and then the man cried out look sharp young chap the furies are at your heels and the fates are going before you look there at the emperor he is looking at you as grim and sour as you could wish him he spoke of the equestrian statue of severus before the basilica on the right 
and attracted by his words agellius went up to a board which was fixed to its base it was an imperial edict and it ran as follows canaeus trajanus decius augustus and quintus herennius etruscus decius caesar emperors unconquerable and pious by united council these whereas we have experienced the benefits and the gifts of the gods and do also enjoy the victory which they have given us over our enemies and moreover salubrity of seasons and abundance in the fruits of the earth therefore acknowledging the aforesaid as our benefactors and the providers of those things which are necessary for the commonwealth we make this our decree that every class of the state freemen and slaves the army and civilians offer to the gods expiatory sacrifices falling down in supplication before them and if any one shall presume to disobey this our divine command which we unite in promulgating we order that man to be thrown into chains and to be subjected to various tortures and should he thereupon be persuaded to reverse his disobedience he shall receive from us no slight honours but should he hold out in opposition first he shall have many tortures and then shall be executed by the sword or thrown into the deep sea or given as a prey to birds and dogs and more than all if such a person be a professor of the christian religion farewell and live happy the old man in the fable called on death and death made his appearance we are very far indeed from meaning that agellius uttered random words or spoke impatiently when he just now expressed a wish to have the opportunity of dying for the faith nevertheless what now met his eyes and was transmitted through them sentence by sentence into his mind was not certainly of a nature to calm the tumult which was busy in breast and brain a sickness came over him and he staggered away the words of the edict still met his eyes and were of a bright red colour the sun was right before him but the letters were in the sun and the sun in his brain he reeled and fell heavily on the pavement no notice was taken of the occurrence by the spectators around him they lazily or curiously looked on and waited to see if he would recover how long he lay there he could not tell when he came to himself if it could really be said to be coming to himself to have the power of motion and an instinct that he must move and move in one direction he managed to rise and lean against the pedestal of a statue and its shade by this time protected him then an intense desire came upon him to get home and that desire gave him a temporary preternatural strength came upon him as a duty to leave sicca for his cottage and he set off he had a confused notion that he must do his duty and go straight forward and turn neither to the right nor the left and stop nowhere but move on steadily for his true home but next an impression came upon him that he was running away from persecution and that this ought not to be and that he ought to face the enemy or at least not to hide from him but meekly wait for him as he went along the narrow streets which led down the hill towards the city gate this thought came so powerfully upon him that at length he sat down on a stone which projected from an open shop and thought of surrendering himself he felt the benefit of the rest and this he fancied to be the calm of conscience consequent upon self-surrender and resignation it was a fruiterer's stall and the owner seeing his exhaustion offered him some slices of a watermelon for his refreshment he ate one of them and then again a vague feeling came on him that he was in danger of idolatry and must protest against idolatry and that he ought not to remain in the neighbourhood of temptation so throwing down the small coin which was sufficient for payment he continued his journey the rest and the refreshment of the fruit and the continued shade which the narrow street allowed him allayed the fever and for the time recruited him and he moved on languidly the sun however was still high in heaven and when he got beyond the city beat down upon his head from a cloudless sky he painfully toiled up the ascent which led to his cottage he had nearly gained the gate of his homestead he saw his old household slave born in his father's house a christian like himself coming to meet him 
a dizziness came over him he lost his senses and fell down helplessly upon the bank end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. And Resurrection. Eucundus was quite as much amused as provoked at the result of the delicate negotiation in which he had entangled his nephew. It was a gratification to him to find that its ill success had been owing in no respect to any fault on the side of Agellius. He had done his part without shrinking and the view which he eucundus had taken of his state of mind was satisfactorily confirmed he had nothing to fear from agellius and though he had failed in securing the guarantee which he had hoped for his attachment to things as they were yet in the process of failure it had been proved that his nephew might be trusted without it and it was a question whether a girl so full of whims and caprices as callista might after all have done him any permanent good the absurd notion indeed of her having a leaning for christianity had been refuted by her conduct on the occasion still who could rely on a clever and accomplished greek there were secret societies and conspiracies in abundance and she might have involved so weak and innocent a fellow in some plans against the government now or at a future time or might have alienated him from his uncle or in some way or other made a fool of him if she had consented to have him for her slave why she had rejected so eligible a suitor it was now useless and idle to inquire it might be that the haughty or greedy greek had required him to bid higher for her favourable notice if the negotiation had taken such a turn then indeed there was still more gratifying evidence of agellius having broken from his fantastic and peevish superstition still however he was not without anxiety now that the severe measures directed against the christians were in progress no overt act indeed beyond the publication of the edict had been taken in sicca probably would be taken at all the worst was that something must be done to make a show he could have wished that some of the multitude of townspeople half suspected of christianity had stood firm and suffered themselves to be tortured and executed one or two would have been enough but the magistracy got no credit with the central government for zeal and activity if no christians were made an example of yet still it was a question whether the strong acts at carthage and elsewhere would not suffice though the lesser towns did nothing at least while the populace was quiet there was nothing to press for severity there were no rich christians in sicca to tempt the cupidity of the informer or of the magistrate no political partisans among them who had made enemies with this or that class of the community but supposing a bad feeling to rise in the populace supposing the magistrates to have ill-wishers and rivals and what men in power had not who might be glad to catch them tripping and make a case against them at rome why it must be confessed that agellius was nearly the only victim who could be pitched upon he wished callista no harm but if a christian must be found and held up in terrorum he would rather it was a person like her without connections and home than the member of any decent family of sicca whose fair fame would be compromised by a catastrophe however she was not a christian and agellius was at least by profession and his fear was lest juba should be right in his estimate of his brother's character juba had said that agellius could be as obstinate as he was ordinarily indolent and yielding and eucundus dreaded lest if he were rudely charged with christianity and bidden to renounce it under pain of punishment he would rebel against the tyrannical order and go to prison and to death out of sheer perverseness or sense of honour with these perplexities before him he could find nothing better than the following plan of action which had been in his mind for some time while the edict remained inoperative he would do nothing at all and let agellius go on with his country occupations which would keep him out of the way but if any disposition appeared of a popular commotion 
or a movement on the part of the magistracy he determined to get possession of agellius and forcibly confine him in his own house in sickness he hoped that in the case of one so young so uncommitted he should have influence with the municipal authorities or at the praetorium or in the camp for the camp and the praetorium were under different jurisdictions in the proconsulate to shelter agellius from a public inquiry into his religious tenets or if this could not be to smuggle him out of the city he was ready to affirm solemnly that his nephew was no christian though he was touched in the head and from an affection parallel to hydrophobia to which the disciples of galen ought to turn their attention he was sent into convulsions on the sight of an altar his father indeed was a malignant old atheist there was no harm in being angry with the dead but it was very hard the son should suffer for his father's offence if he must be judged of by his parents let him rather have the advantage of the thorough loyalty and religiousness of his mother a most zealous old lady in high repute in the neighbourhood of sicca for her theurgic knowledge a staunch friend of the imperial government which had before now been indebted to her for important information and as staunch a hater of the christians such was the plan of proceedings resolved on by jucundus before he received the news of his nephew's serious malady it did not reach him till many days after and then he did not go to see him first lest he should be supposed to be in communication with him next as having no respect for that romantic sort of generosity which risks the chances of contagion for the absurd ceremony of paying a compliment it was thus that eucundus addressed himself to the present state of affairs and anticipated the chances of the future as to aristo he had very little personal interest in the matter his sister might have thwarted him in affairs which lay nearer his heart than the moral emancipation of agellius and as she generally complied with his suggestions and wishes whatever they were he did not grudge her her liberty of action in this instance nor had the occurrence which had taken place any great visible effect upon callista herself she had lost her right to be indignant with her brother and she resigned or rather abandoned herself to her destiny her better feelings had been brought out for the moment in her conversation with agellius but they were not ordinary ones true she was tired but she was the slave of the world and agellius had only made her more sceptical than before that there was any service better so at least she said to herself she said it was fantastic to go elsewhere for good and that if life was short then as her brother said it was necessary to make the most of it and meanwhile what of agellius himself why it will be some little time before agellius will be in a condition to moralize upon anything his faithful slave half carried half drew him into the cottage and stretched him upon his bed then having sufficient skill for the ordinary illnesses of the country though this was more than an ordinary fever he drew blood from him gave him a draught of herbs and left him to the slow but safe processes of nature to restore him it could not be affirmed that he was not in considerable danger of life yet youth carries hope with it and his attendant had little to fear for his recovery for some days certainly agellius had no apprehension of anything except of restlessness and distress of sleepless nights or dreary miserable dreams at length one morning as he was lying on his back with his eyes shut it came into his mind to ask himself whether sunday would ever come he had been accustomed upon the first day of the week to say some particular prayers and psalms and unite himself in spirit with his brethren beyond seas and then he tried to remember the last sunday and the more he thought the less he could remember it till he began to think that months had gone without a sunday this he was certain of that he had lost reckoning for he had made no notches for the days for a long while past and unless his slave asper knew there was no one to tell him here he got so puzzled that it was like one of the bad dreams which had worried him he felt it affect his head and he was obliged to give up the inquiry 
from this time his sleep was better and more refreshing for several days he was more collected when he was awake and was able to ask himself why he lay there and what had happened to him then gradually his memory began to return like the dawning of the day the cause and the circumstances of his recent visit to the city point after point came up and he felt first wonder and then certainty he recollected the forum and then the edict a solemn overpowering emotion here seized him and for a while he dared not think more when he recovered and tried to pursue the events of the day he found himself unequal to the task all was dark except that he had some vague remembrance of thirsting and some one giving him to drink and then his saying with the psalmist transivimus per ignum et aquam he opened his eyes and looked about him he was at home there was some one at the bedhead whom he could not see hanging over him and he was too weak to raise himself and so command a view of him he waited patiently being too feeble to have any great anxiety on the subject presently a voice addressed him you are recovering my son it said who are you said agellius abruptly the person spoken to applied his mouth to agellius's ear and uttered lowly several sacred names agellius would have started up had he been strong enough he could but sink down upon his rushes in agitation be content to know no more at present said the stranger praise god as i do you know enough for your present strength it is your act of obedience for the day it was a deep clear peaceful authoritative voice in his present state as we have said it cost agellius no great effort to mortify curiosity and the accents of that voice soothed him and the mystery employed his mind and had something pleasing and attractive in it moreover about the main point there was no mystery and could be no mistake that he was in the hands of a christian ecclesiastic the stranger occupied himself for a time with a book of prayers which he carried about him and then again with the duties of a sick-bed he sprinkled vinegar over agellius's face and about the room and supplied him with the refreshment of cooling fruit he kept the flies from tormenting him and did his best so to arrange his posture that he might suffer least from his long lying in the morning and evening he let in the air and he excluded the sultry noon in these various occupations he was from time to time removed to a distance from the patient who thus had an opportunity of observing him the stranger was of middle height upright and well proportioned he was dressed in a peasant's or slave's dark tunic his face was rather round than long his hair black yet with a promise of greyness with what might be baldness in the crown or a priest's tonsure his short beard curled round his chin his complexion was very clear but the most striking point about him was his eyes they were of a light or greyish blue transparent and shining like precious stones from the day that they first interchanged words the priest said some short prayers from time to time with agellius the lord's prayer and portions of the psalms afterwards when he was well enough to converse agellius was struck with the inexpressible peculiarity of his manner it was self-collected serene gentle tender unobtrusive unstudied it enabled him to say things severe and even stern without startling offending or repelling the hearer he spoke very little about himself though from time to time points of detail were elicited of his history in the course of conversation he said that his name was cecilius asper when he entered the room would kneel down and offer to kiss the stranger's sandal though the latter generally managed to prevent it cecilius did not speak much about himself but agellius on the other hand found it a relief to tell out his own history and reflect upon and describe his own feelings as he lay on his bed he half soliloquized half addressed himself to the stranger sometimes he required an answer sometimes he seemed to require none once he asked suddenly after a long silence whether a man could be baptized twice 
and when the priest answered distinctly in the negative agellius replied that if so he thought it would be best never to be baptized till the hour of death it was a question he said which had perplexed him a good deal but he never had had any one to converse with on the subject cacilius answered but how could you promise yourself that you would be able to obtain the sacrament at the last moment the water and the administrator might come just too late and then where would you be my son and then again how do you know you would wish it is your will simply in your own power carpe diem take god's gift while you can the benefit is so immense answered agellius that one would wish if one could to enter into the unseen world without losing its fullness this cannot be if a long time elapses between baptism and death you are then of the number of those said cacilius who would cheat their maker of his claim on their life provided they could as it is said in their last moment cheat the devil agellius continuing silent cacilius added you want to enjoy this world and to inherit the next is it so i'm puzzled my head is weak father i do not see my way to speak presently he said sin after baptism is so awful a matter there is no second labor for sin and then again to sin against baptism is so great a sin the priest said in baptism god becomes your father your own god your worship your love can you give up this great gift all through your life would you live without god in this world tears came into agellius's eyes and his throat became oppressed at last he said distinctly and tenderly no after a while the priest said i suppose what you fear is the fire of judgment and the prison not lest you should fall away and be lost i know my dear father answered the sick youth that i have no right to reckon on anything or promise myself anything yet somehow i have never feared hell though i ought i know i ought but i have not i deserve the worst but somehow i have thought that god would lead me on he ever has done so then you fear the fire of judgment said cacilius you'd put off baptism for fear of that fire i did not say i would answered agellius i wanted you to explain the thing to me which would you rather agellius be without god here or suffer the fire there agellius smiled he said faintly i take him for my portion here and there he will be in the fire with me agellius lay quiet for some hours and seemed to sleep suddenly he began again i was baptized when i was only six years old i am glad you do not think it was wilful in me and wrong i cannot tell what took me he presently continued it was a fervour i have had nothing of the kind since what does our lord say i can't remember novissima pejora prioribus he continued the train of thought another day or rather the course of his argument for on the thought itself his mind seemed ever to be working my spring is gone he said and i have no summer nay i have had no spring it was a day not a season it came and it went where am i now can spring ever return i wish to begin again in right earnest thank god my son for this great mercy said cacilius that though you have relaxed you have never severed yourself from the peace of the church you have not denied your god agellius sighed bitterly oh my father he said eravi sicut ovis quae periit i have been very near denying him at least by outward act you do not know me you cannot know what has come on me lately and i dare not look back on it my heart is so weak my father how am i to repent of what is past 
when i dare not think of it to think of it is to renew the sin who are meus noli timere answered the priest si transieris per ignum odor eus non erit in te in penance the grace of god carries you without harm through thoughts and words which would harm you apart from it ah penance said agellius i recollect the catechism what is it father a new grace i know a plank after baptism may i have it you are not strong enough yet to think of these things agellius answered cecilius please god you shall get well then you shall review all your life and bring it out in order before him and he through me will wipe away all that has been amiss praise him who has spared you for this it was too much for the patient in his weak state he could but shed happy tears another day he had sat up in bed he looked at his hands from which the skin was peeling he felt his lips and it was with them the same and his hair seemed coming off also he smiled and said renovabitur ut aquila juventus mea cecilius responded as before with sacred words which were new to agellius qui sperant in domino mutabunt fortitudinem assument penas sicut aquilae sursum corda you must soar agellius sursum corda answered he i know those words they are old friends where have i heard them i can't recollect but they are in my earliest memories ah but my father my heart is below not above i want to tell you all i want to tell you about one who has enthralled my heart who has divided it with my true love but i daren't speak of her as i have said i dare not speak lest i be carried away oh i blush to say it she is a heathen may god save her soul will he come to me and not to her and vestigabiles vie eus he remained silent for some time then he said father i mean to dedicate myself to god simply absolutely with his grace i will be his and he shall be mine no one shall come between us but oh this weak heart keep your good resolves till you are stronger said the priest it is easy to make them on a sick-bed you must first reckon the charges agellius smiled i know the passage father he said and he repeated the sacred words if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters yea in his own life also he cannot be my disciple another time agellius said the martyrs surely the old bishop used to say something about the martyrs he spoke of a second baptism and called it a baptism of blood and said might his soul be with the martyrs father would not this wash out everything as the first it was now cecilius who smiled and his eyes shone like the sapphires of the holy city and he seemed the ideal of him who when called upon to face some awful moment to which heaven has joined great issues good or bad for humankind is happy as a lover and attired with sudden brightness like a man inspired however he soon controlled himself and said quo ego vado non potes me modo sequi sequeris autem postea end of chapter thirteen Chapter 14 of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A small cloud. This sort of intercourse, growing in frequency and fullness, went on for about a week till Agellius was able to walk with support and to leave the cottage. The priest and his own slave took him between them and seated him one evening in sight of the glorious prospect 
traversed by the long shadow of the far mountains behind which the sun was making its way the air was filled with a thousand odours the brilliant colouring of the western heavens was contrasted with the more sober but varied tints of the rich country the wheat and barley harvest was over but the beans were late and still stood in the fields the olives and chestnut trees were full of fruit the early fig was supplying the markets with food and the numerous vineyards were patiently awaiting the suns of the next month slowly to perfect their present promise the beautiful scene had a moral dignity from its associations with human sustenance and well-being the inexpressible calmness of evening was flung like a robe over it its sweetness was too much for one who had been confined to the monotony of a sick-room and was still an invalid he sat silent and in tears it was life from the dead and he felt he had risen to a different life and thus he came out evening after evening convalescent gradually and surely advancing to perfect restoration of his health one evening he said after feeding his eyes and thoughts for some time with the prospect mansueti hereditabunt teram they alone have real enjoyment of this earth who believe in its maker every breath of air seems to whisper how good he is to me cecilius answered these sights are the shadows of that fairer paradise which is our home where there is no beast of prey no venomous reptile no sin my child should i not feel this more than you those who are shut up in crowded cities see but the work of man which is evil it is the compensation of my flight from carthage that i am brought before the face of god the heathen worship all this as if god himself said agellius how strange it seems to me that any one can forget the creator in his works cecilius was silent for a moment and sighed he then said you have ever been a christian agellius and you have not my father answered he well you have earned that grace which came to me freely agellius said the priest it comes freely to all and is only merited when it has already prevailed yet i think you earned it too else why the difference between you and your brother what do you know of us asked agellius quickly not a great deal answered he yet something three or four years back an effort was made to rekindle the christian spirit in these parts and to do something for the churches of the proconsulate and to fill up the vacant sees nothing has come of it as yet but steps were taken towards it one was to obtain a recovery of the christians who remained in them i was sent here for that purpose and in this way heard of you and your brother when my life was threatened by the persecution and i had to flee i thought of your cottage i was obliged to act secretly as we did not know friends from foes you were led here for other purposes towards me my father said agellius yet you cannot have a safer refuge there is nothing to disturb nothing to cause suspicion here in this harvest time numbers of strangers pour in from the mountains of various races there is nothing to distinguish you from one of them and my brother is away convoying some grain to carthage persecution drove you hither but you have not been suffered to be idle my father you have brought home a wanderer he added after a pause i am well enough to go to confession to you now may it be this evening it will be well answered cecilius how long i shall still be here i cannot tell i am expecting my trusty messenger with dispatches it is now three days since he was here however this i say without misgiving we do not part for long what do you hear longer you must come to me i must prepare you and send you back to sicca to collect and restore this scattered flock agellius turned and leaned against the priest's shoulder and laughed i am laughing he said not from lightness of mind but from the depth of surprise and of joy that you should so think of me it was a dream which once i had but impossible you do not think that i weak i shall ever be able to do more than save my own soul you will save your own soul by saving the souls of others said cecilius my child i could tell you more things if i thought it good for you 
but my father i have so weak so soft a heart cried agellius what am i to do with myself i am not of the temper of which heroes are made virtus in infirmitati perficitur said the priest what are you to do anything of yourself or are you to be simply the instrument of another we shall have the same termination you and myself but you long after me ah father because you will burn out so much more quickly said agellius i think said cacilius i see my messenger there is some one who has made his way by stealth into the garden or at least not by the beaten way there was a visitor as cacilius had said however it was not his messenger but juba who approached looking with great curiosity at cacilius and absorbed in the sight cacilius in turn regarded him steadfastly and then said to agellius it is your brother what brings you here juba said the latter i have been away on a distant errand said juba and find you have been ill is this your nurse he eyed him almost sternly and added tis a christian priest has agellius no acquaintance but christians asked cacilius my acquaintance oh surely answered juba agreeable innocent sweet acquaintance of another sort myself to begin with my lad he continued you did not rise to their price but you did your best juba said his brother if you have any business here say it and have done i am not strong enough to hold any altercation with you business said juba i can find quite business enough here if i choose this is a priest of the christians i am sure of it cacilius looked at him with such calmness and benevolence that at length juba turned away his eyes with something of irritation he said if i am a priest i am here to claim you as one of my children juba winced but said scornfully you are mistaken there father speak to those who own you i am a free man my son cacilius answered you have been under instruction it is your duty to go forward not back what do you know about me said juba he has been telling your face your manner your voice tells a tale i need no information from others i have heard of you years ago now i see you what do you see in me said juba i see pride in bodily shape treading down faith and conviction said cacilius juba neighed rather than laughed so fierce and scornful was its expression ah oh, what you slaves call pride he said i call dignity you believe in a god creator of heaven and earth as certainly as i do said the priest but you deliberately set yourself against him juba smiled i am as free he said in my place as he in his you mean answered cacilius free to do wrong and free to suffer for it you may call it wrong and call it suffering replied juba but for me i do not call wrong what he calls wrong and if he puts me to pain it is because he is the stronger the priest stopped a while there was no emotion on either side it was strange to see them so passionless so antagonistic like st michael and his adversary there is that within you said cacilius which speaks as i speak that inward voice takes the part of the creator and condemns you he put it there said juba and i will take care to put it out then he will have justice as well as power on his side said the priest i will never fawn or crouch said juba i will be lord and master in my own soul every faculty shall be mine there shall be no divided allegiance cacilius paused again he said at length my son my soul tells me or rather my maker tells me and your maker that some heavy judgment is impending over you do penance while you may tell your forebodings to women and children said juba i am prepared for anything i will not be crushed agellius was not strong enough to bear a part in such a scene father he said it is his way but 
don't believe him he has better thoughts away with you juba you are not wanted here agellius said the priest such words are not strange to me i am not young and have seen much of the world and my very office and position elicits blasphemies from others from time to time i knew a man who carried out his bad thoughts and words into act abjuring his maker he abandoned himself to the service of the evil one he betrayed his brethren to death he lived on year after year and became old he was smitten with illness then i first saw him i made him contemplate a picture it was the picture of the good shepherd i dwelt on the vain efforts of the poor sheep to get out of the fold its irrational aversion to its home and its desperate resolution to force a way through the prickly fence it was pierced and torn with the sharp aloe at last it lay imprisoned in its stern embrace motionless and bleeding then the shepherd though he had to wound his own hands in the work disengaged it and brought it back god has his own times his power went along with the picture and the man was moved i said this is his return for your enmity he is determined to have you cost him what it will i need not go through the many things that followed but the issue may be told in a few words he came back he lived a life of penance at the church's door he received the peace of the church in immediate prospect of the persecution and has within the last ten days died a martyr's death juba had listened as if he was constrained against his will when the priest stopped he started and began to speak impetuously and unlike his ordinary tone he placed his hands violently against his ears stop he said no more i will not betray them no i need not betray them he laughed the black moor does the work himself look he cried seizing the priest's arm and pointing to a part of the forest which happened to be windward you are in their number priest who can foretell the destinies of others and are blind to their own read there the task is not hard your coming fortunes his finger was directed to a spot where amid the thick foliage the gleam of a pool or of a marsh was visible the various waters round about issuing from the gravel or drained from the nightly damps had run into a hollow filled with the decaying vegetation of former years and were languidly filtered out into a brook more healthy than the vast reservoir itself its banks were bordered with a deep broad layer of mud a transition substance between the rich vegetable matter which it once had been and the multitudinous world of insect life which it was becoming a cloud or mist at this time was hanging over it high in air a harsh and shrill sound a whizzing or a chirping proceeded from that cloud to the ear of the attentive listener what these indications portended was plain there said juba is what will tell more against you than imperial edict informer or proconsular apparitor and no work of mine he turned down the bank and disappeared agellius and his guest looked at each other in dismay it is the locusts they whispered to each other as they went back into the cottage End of chapter fourteen Chapter fifteen of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A visitation. The plague of locusts, one of the most awful visitations to which the countries included in the Roman Empire were exposed, extended from the Atlantic to Ethiopia, from Arabia to India, and from the Nile and Red Sea to Greece and the north of Asia Minor instances are recorded in history of clouds of the devastating insect crossing the black sea to poland and the mediterranean to lombardy it is as numerous in its species as it is wide in its range of territory brood follows brood with a sort of family likeness yet with distinct attributes as we read in the prophets of the old testament from whom bochart tells us it is possible to enumerate as many as ten kinds it wakens into existence and activity as early as the month of march but instances are not wanting as in our present history of its appearance as late as june 
even one flight comprises myriads upon myriads passing imagination to which the drops of rain or the sands of the sea are the only fit comparison and hence it is almost a proverbial mode of expression in the east as may be illustrated by the sacred pages to which we just now referred by way of describing a vast invading army to liken it to the locusts so dense are they when upon the wing that it is no exaggeration to say that they hide the sun from which circumstance indeed their name in arabic is derived and so ubiquitous are they when they have alighted on the earth that they simply cover or clothe its surface this last characteristic is stated in the sacred account of the plagues of egypt where their faculty of devastation is also mentioned the corrupting fly and the bruising and prostrating hail had preceded them in that series of visitations but they came to do the work of ruin more thoroughly for not only the crops and fruits but the foliage of the forest itself nay the small twigs and the bark of the trees are the victims of their curious and energetic rapacity they have been known even to gnaw the door-posts of the houses nor do they execute their task in so slovenly a way that as they have succeeded other plagues so they may have successors themselves they take pains to spoil what they leave like the harpies they smear every thing that they touch with a miserable slime which has the effect of a virus in corroding or as some say in scorching and burning it and then as if all this were little when they can do nothing else they die as if out of sheer malevolence to man for the poisonous elements of their nature are then let loose and dispersed abroad and create a pestilence and they manage to destroy many more by their death than in their life such are the locusts whose existence the ancient heretics brought forward as their palmary proof that there was an evil creator and of whom an arabian writer shows his national horror when he says that they have the head of a horse the eyes of an elephant the neck of a bull the horns of a stag the breast of a lion the belly of a scorpion the wings of an eagle the legs of a camel the feet of an ostrich and the tail of a serpent and now they are rushing upon a considerable tract of that beautiful region of which we have spoken with such admiration the swarm to which juba pointed grew and grew till it became a compact body as much as a furlong square yet it was but the vanguard of a series of similar hosts formed one after another out of the hot mould or sand rising into the air like clouds enlarging into a dusky canopy and then discharged against the fruitful plain at length the huge innumerous mass was put into motion and began its career darkening the face of day as became an instrument of divine power it seemed to have no volition of its own it was set off it drifted with the wind and thus made northwards straight for sicca thus they advanced host after host for a time wafted on the air and gradually declining to the earth while fresh broods were carried over the first and neared the earth after a longer flight in their turn for twelve miles did they extend from front to rear and their whizzing and hissing could be heard for six miles on every side of them the bright sun though hidden by them illumined their bodies and was reflected from their quivering wings and as they heavily fell earthward they seemed like the innumerable flakes of a yellow-coloured snow and like snow did they descend a living carpet or rather pall upon fields crops gardens copses groves orchards vineyards olive woods orangeries palm plantations and the deep forests sparing nothing within their reach and where there was nothing to devour lying helpless in drifts or crawling forward obstinately as best they might with the hope of prey they could spare their hundred thousand soldiers twice or thrice over and not miss them their masses filled the bottoms of the ravines and hollow ways impeding the traveller as he rode forward on his journey and trampled by thousands under his horse hoofs in vain was all this overthrow and waste by the roadside in vain their loss in river pool and watercourse 
the poor peasants hastily dug pits and trenches as their enemy came on in vain they filled them from the wells or with lighted stubble heavily and thickly did the locusts fall they were lavish of their lives they choked the flame and the water which destroyed them the while and the vast living hostile armament still moved on they moved right on like soldiers in their ranks stopping at nothing and straggling for nothing they carried a broad furrow or wheel all across the country black and loathsome while it was as green and smiling on each side of them and in front as it had been before they came before them in the language of prophets was a paradise and behind them a desert they are daunted by nothing they surmount walls and hedges and enter closed gardens or inhabited houses a rare and experimental vineyard has been planted in a sheltered grove the high winds of africa will not commonly allow the light trellis or the slim pole but here the lofty poplar of campania has been possible on which the vine plant mounts so many yards into the air that the poor grape gatherers bargain for a funeral pile and a tomb as one of the conditions of their engagement the locusts have done what the winds and lightning could not do and the whole promise of the vintage leaves and all is gone and the slender stems are left bare there is another yard less uncommon but still tended with more than common care each plant is kept within due bounds by a circular trench round it and by upright canes on which it is to trail in an hour the solicitude and long toil of the vine dresser are lost and his pride humbled there is a smiling farm another sort of vine of remarkable character is found against the farmhouse this vine springs from one root and has clothed and matted with its many branches the four walls the whole of it is covered thick with long clusters which another month will ripen on every grape and leaf there is a locust into the dry caves and pits carefully strewed with straw the harvestmen have safely as they thought just now been lodging the far-famed african wheat one grain or root shoots up into ten twenty fifty eighty nay three or four hundred stalks sometimes the stalks have two ears apiece and these again shoot into a number of lesser ones these stores are intended for the roman populace but the locusts have been beforehand with them the small patches of ground belonging to the poor peasants up and down the country for raising the turnips garlic barley watermelons on which they live are the prey of these glutton invaders as much as the choicest vines and olives nor have they any reverence for the villa of the civic decurion or the roman official the neatly arranged kitchen garden with its cherries plums peaches and apricots is a waste as the slaves sit round in the kitchen in the first court at their coarse evening meal the room is filled with the invading force the news comes to them that the enemy has fallen upon the apples and pears in the basement and is at the same time plundering and sacking the preserves of quince and pomegranate and revelling in the jars of precious oil of cyprus and mendes in the store-rooms they come up to the walls of sicca and are flung against them into the ditch not a moment's hesitation or delay they recover their footing they climb up the wood or stucco they surmount the parapet or they have entered in at the windows filling the apartments and the most private and luxurious chambers not one or two like stragglers at forage or rioters after a victory but in order of battle and with the array of an army choice plants or flowers about the impluvia and cisti for ornament or refreshment myrtles oranges pomegranates the rose and the carnation have disappeared they dim the bright marbles of the walls and the gilding of the ceilings they enter the triclinium in the midst of the banquet they crawl over the viands and spoil what they do not devour unrelaxed by success and by enjoyment onward they go a secret mysterious instinct keeps them together as if they had a king over them they move along the floor in so strange an order that they seem to be a tessellated pavement themselves 
and to be the artificial embellishment of the place so true are their lines and so perfect is the pattern they describe onward they go to the market to the temple sacrifices to the baker's stores to the cook shops to the confectioners to the druggists nothing comes amiss to them wherever man has aught to eat or drink there are they reckless of death strong of appetite certain of conquest they have passed on the men of sicca sadly congratulate themselves and begin to look about them and to sum up their losses being the proprietors of the neighbouring districts or the purchasers of its produce they lament over the devastation not because the fair country is disfigured but because income is becoming scanty and prices are becoming high how is a population of many thousands to be fed where is the grain where are the melons the figs the dates the gourds the beans the grapes to sustain and solace the multitudes in their lanes caverns and garrets this is another weighty consideration for the class well-to-do in the world the taxes too and contributions the capitation tax the percentage upon corn the various articles of revenues due to rome how are they to be paid how are cattle to be provided for the sacrifices and for the tables of the wealthy one half at least of the supply of sicca is cut off no longer slaves are seen coming into the city from the country in troops with their baskets on their shoulders or beating forward the horse or mule or ox overladen with its burden or driving in the dangerous cow or the unresisting sheep the animation of the place is gone a gloom hangs over the forum and if its frequenters are still merry there is something of sullenness and recklessness in their mirth the gods have given the city up something or other has angered them locusts indeed are no uncommon visitation but at an earlier season perhaps some temple has been polluted or some unholy rite practised or some secret conspiracy has spread another and a still worse calamity the invaders as we have already intimated could be more terrible still in their overthrow than in their ravages the inhabitants of the country had attempted where they could to destroy them by fire and water it would seem as if the malignant animals had resolved that the sufferers should have the benefit of this policy to the full for they had not got more than twenty miles beyond sicca when they suddenly sickened and died thus after they had done all the mischief they could do by their living when they had made their foul maws the grave of every living thing then they died themselves and made the desolated land their own grave they took from it its hundred forms and varieties of beautiful life and left it their own fetid and poisonous carcasses in payment it was a sudden catastrophe they seemed making for the mediterranean as if like other great conquerors they had other worlds to subdue beyond it but whether they were overgorged or struck by some atmospheric change or that their time was come and they paid the debt of nature so it was that suddenly they fell and their glory came to naught and all was vanity to them as to others and their stench rose up and their corruption rose up because they had done proudly the hideous swarms lay dead in the moist steaming underwoods in the green swamps in the sheltered valleys in the ditches and furrows of the fields amid the monuments of their own prowess the ruined crops and the dishonoured vineyards a poisonous element issuing from their remains mingled with the atmosphere and corrupted it the dismayed peasant found that a pestilence had begun a new visitation not confined to the territory which the enemy had made its own but extending far and wide as the atmosphere extends in all directions their daily toil no longer claimed by the produce of the earth which has ceased to exist is now devoted to the object of ridding themselves of the deadly legacy which they have received in its stead in vain it is their last toil they are digging pits they are raising piles for their own corpses as well as for the bodies of their enemies invader and victim lie in the same grave 
burn in the same heap they sicken while they work and the pestilence spreads a new invasion is menacing sicca in the shape of companies of peasants and slaves panic having broken the bonds of discipline with their employers and overseers nay the farmers themselves and proprietors rushing thither from famine and infection as to a place of safety the inhabitants of the city are as frightened as they and more energetic they determine to keep them at a distance the gates are closed a strict cordon is drawn however by the continued pressure numbers contrive to make an entrance as water into a vessel or light through the closed shutters and anyhow the air cannot be put into quarantine so the pestilence has the better of it and at last appears in the alleys and in the cellars of sicca end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain worse and worse o wretched minds of men o blind hearts truly cries out a great heathen poet but on grounds far other than the true ones the true ground of such a lamentation is that men do not interpret the signs of the times and of the world as he intends who has placed these signs in the heavens that when mane thecal fares is written upon the ethereal wall they have no inward faculty to read them withal and that when they go elsewhere for one learned in tongues instead of taking daniel who is used to converse with angels they rely on magi or chaldeans who know only the languages of earth so it was with the miserable population of sicca now half famished seized with a pestilence which was sure to rage before it assuaged perplexed and oppressed by the recoil upon them of the population whom they had from time to time sent out into the surrounding territory or from whom they had supplied their markets they never fancied that the real cause of the visitation which we have been describing was their own iniquity in their maker's sight that his arm inflicted it and that its natural and direct interpretation was do penance and be converted on the contrary they looked only at their own vain idols and at the vain rites which these idols demanded and they thought there was no surer escape from their misery than by upholding a lie and putting down all who revolted from it and thus the visitation which was sent to do them good turned through their wilful blindness to their greater condemnation the forum which at all times was the resort of idleness and dissipation now became more and more the haunt of famine and sickness of robust frames without work of slavish natures virtually and for the time emancipated and uncontrolled of youth and passion houseless and shelterless in groups and companies in and out of the porticoes on the steps of the temples and about the booths and stalls of the market a multitude grows day by day from the town and from the country and of all the various races which town and country contain the civil magistracy and the civil force to which the peace of the city was committed were not equal to such an emergency as the present and the milites stationarii a sort of garrison who represented the roman power though they were ready to act against either magistrates or mob impartially had no tenderness for either when in collision with each other indeed the bonds of society were broken and every political element was at war with every other in a case of such great common calamity when every one was angry with every one else for want of some clearly defined object against which the common anger might be discharged with unanimity they had almost given over sacrificing and consulting the flame or the entrails for no reversal or respite of their sufferings had followed their most assiduous acts of deprecation moreover the omens were generally considered by the priests to have been unpropitious or adverse a sheep had been discovered to have instead of a liver something very like a gizzard a sow had chewed and swallowed the flowers with which it had been embellished for the sacrifice 
and a calf after receiving the fatal blow instead of lying down and dying dashed into the temple dripping blood upon the pavement as it went and at last fell and expired just before the sacred aditum in despair the people took to fortune-telling and its attendant arts old crones were found in plenty with their strange rites the stranger the more welcome trenches were dug and by-places for sacrifices to the infernal gods amulets rings counters tablets pebbles nails bones feathers ephesian or egyptian legends were in request and raised the hopes or beguiled and occupied the thoughts of those who else would have been directly dwelling on their sufferings present or in prospect others were occupied whether they would or no with diversions fiercer and more earnest there were continual altercations between farmers small proprietors of land government and city officials altercations so manifold and violent that even were there no hubbub of voices and no incoherence of wrath and fear to complicate them we should despair of setting them before the reader an officer from the camp was expostulating with one of the municipal authorities that no corn had been sent thither for the last six or seven days and the functionary attacked had thrown the blame on the farmer and he in turn had protested that he could not get cattle to bring the wagons into sicca those which he had set out with had died of exhaustion on the journey a clerk as we now speak in the officium of the society of publicans or collectors of annona was threatening a number of small tenants with ejection for not sending in their rated portion of corn for the roman people the officium of the notarius or assistant prefect had written up to sicca from carthage in violent terms and come it must though the locusts had eaten up every stack and granary a number of half-starved peasants had been summoned for payment of their taxes and in spite of their ignorance of latin they had been made to understand that death was the stern penalty of neglecting to bring the coin they on the other hand by their fierce doggedness of manner seemed to signify by way of answer that death was not a penalty unless life was a boon the villicus of one of the decurions who had an estate in the neighbourhood was laying his miseries before the man of business of his employer what are we to do he said half the gang of slaves is dead and the other half is so feeble that i can't get through the work of the month we ought to be sheep shearing you have no chance of wool we ought to be swarming the bees pressing the honey boiling and purifying the wax we ought to be plucking the white leaves of the chamomile and steeping the golden flowers in oil we ought to be gathering the wild grapes sifting off the flowers and preserving the residue in honey we ought to be sowing brassicum parsley and coriander against next spring we ought to be cheese-making we ought to be baking white and red bricks and tiles in the sun we have no hands for the purpose the villicus is not to blame but the anger of the gods the country employee of the procurator of the imperial bafia protests that the insect cannot be found from which the dye is extracted and argues that the locusts must have devoured them or the plant on which they feed or that they have been carried off by the pestilence here is old corbulus in agonies for his febrifuge and a slave of his is in high words with the market carrier who tells him that mago who supplied it is dead of a worse fever than his master's the rogue cried the slave my master has contracted with him for the year and has paid him the money in advance a jeering and mocking from the crowd assailed the unfortunate domestic who so truly foreboded that his return without the medicine would be the signal for his summary committal to the pistrinum let old corbulus follow mago in his passage to perdition said one of the rabble let him take his physic with pluto and leave us the bread and wine on which he's grown gouty bread bread was the response elicited by this denunciation and it spread into a circle larger than that of which the slave and the carrier were part wine and bread ceres and liber cried a young legionary who after a night of revelry was emerging still half intoxicated from one of the low wine-shops in the vaults which formed the basement of the thermae or hot baths 
make way there you filthy slime of the earth you half kneaded half fermented africans who never yet have quite been men but have ever smelt strong of the baboon who are three-quarters must and two vinegar and a fifth water as i was saying you are like bad liquor and the sight of you disagrees with the stomach and affects the eyes the crowd looked sullenly and without wincing at his shield which was the only portion of his military accoutrements which he had preserved after his carouse the white surface with the silver boss in the centre surrounded by first a white and then a red circle and the purple border showed that he belonged to the terziani or third italic legion which had been stationed in africa since the time of augustus vile double-tongued mongrels he continued what are you fit for but to gather the fruits of the earth for your owners and lords romanos dominos rerum and if there are now no fruits to reap why your service is gone go home and die and drown yourselves for what are you fit for now except to take your dead corpses away from the nostrils of a roman the cream of humankind ye base-born apes that's why you catch the pestilence because our blood mantles and foams in our ruddy veins like new milk in the wine-cup which is too strong for this clime and my blood is up and i drink a full measure of it to great rome for what does old horace say but nunc est bibendum and so get out of my way to a good part of the multitude both peasantry and town rabble latin was unintelligible but they all understood vocabulary and syntax and logic as soon as he drew his knuckles across one fellow's face who refused to move from his path and as soon as his insult was returned by the latter with a thrust of the dagger a rush was made upon him on which he made a face at them shook his fist and leaping on one side ran with great swiftness to an open space in advance from his quarrelsome humour rather than from fear he raised a cry of alarm on which two or three fellow-soldiers made their appearance from similar dens of intoxication and vice and came up to the rescue the mob assailed them with stones and the cream of human nature was likely to be roughly churned when seeing matters were becoming serious they suddenly took to their heels and got into the temple of asculapius on one side of the forum the mob followed the ministers of the sacred place attempted to shut the gates a scuffle ensued and a riot was in progress self-preservation is the first law of man trembling for the safety of his noble buildings and considering that it was a bread riot as it really was the priest of the god came forward rebuked the mob for its impiety and showed the absurdity of supposing that there were loaves in his enclosure to satisfy its wants but he reminded them that there was a baker's shop at the other end of the forum which was one of the most considerable in sicca a slight impulse determines the movements of an excited multitude off they went to the quarter in question where certainly there was the very large and handsome store of a substantial dealer in grain of all sorts and in other produce the shop however seemed on this occasion to be but poorly furnished for the baker was a prudent man and feared a display of provisions which would be an invitation to a hungry multitude the assailants however were not to be baffled some one cried out that the man had withdrawn his corn from the market for his own ends and that great stores were accumulated within they avail themselves of the hint they pour in through the open front the baker escapes as he may his mills and ovens are smashed the house is ransacked whatever is found is seized thrown about wasted eaten as the case may be and the mob gains strength and appetite for fresh exploits however the rioters have no definite plan of action yet some of them have penetrated into the stable behind the house in search of corn they find the mill ass which ground for the baker and bring it out it is a beast of more than ordinary pretensions such as you would not often see on a mill showing both the wealth of the owner and the flourishing condition of his trade the asses of africa are finer than those in the north but this is fine for an african one fellow mounts upon it and sets off with the world before him like a knight-errant seeking an adventure the rabble at his tail acting as his squire he begins the circuit of the forum and picks up its riff-raff as he goes along here some rascal boys there some drunken women 
here again a number of half-brutalized country slaves and peasants partly out of curiosity partly from idleness from ill-temper from hope of spoil from a vague desire to be doing something or other every one who has nothing to lose by the adventure crowds around and behind him and on the contrary as he advances and the noise and commotion increase every one who has a position of any sort the confidential vernay of great families farmers shopkeepers men of business officials vanish from the scene of action without delay africa africa is now the cry the signal in that country as an ancient writer tells us that the parties raising it have something new in hand and have a mind to do it suddenly as they march on a low and awful growl is heard it comes from the booth of a servant of the imperial court he is employed as a transporter of wild beasts from the interior to the coast where they are shipped for rome and he has charge at present of a noble lion who is sitting majestically looking through the bars of his cage at the rabble who now begin to look at him in demeanour and in mental endowments he has the advantage of them it was at this moment while they were closing hustling each other staring at the beast and hoping to provoke him that a shrill voice cried out christianos ad leones christianos ad leones the christians to the lions a sudden and dead silence ensued as if words had struck the breath out of the promiscuous throng an interval passed and then the same voice was heard again christianos ad leones this time the whole forum took it up from one end to the other the fate of the day the direction of the movement was decided a distinct object was obtained and the only wonder was that the multitude had been so long to seek and so slow to find so obvious a cause of their misfortunes so adequate a subject of their vengeance christianos ad leones was shouted out by town and country priests and people long live the emperor long live decius he told us this long ago there is the edict it never has been obeyed death to the magistrates to the christians to the christians up with great jove down with the atheists they were commencing their march when the ass caught their eye the christians god they shouted out the god of the christians their first impulse was to give the poor beast to the lion their next to sacrifice it but they did not know to whom then they said they would make the christians worship it and dressing it up in tawdry finery they retained it at the head of their procession End of chapter sixteen